indeed uh, wonderful to be here uh, in this place. It's been a couple of years, so it's good to be back. Um, and Carrie and I, uh, Carrie was a member here when we were married, and we were indeed married here, and, and uh, downtown's been very close to our heart. When Carrie and I discerned a call to ministry and went to seminary, this church was very, very generous to us, uh, financially and otherwise. And so it's, it's always nice to come back and, and uh, tell that story and Uh, We are continually grateful for that. So we drove up this morning from Fredericksburg. It only takes 40 minutes on Sunday morning. We won't tell you what it takes on other days of the week, but um, we are certainly uh, glad to be with you. If you'll take your uh, Bibles, we're in uh, Ephesians, and we're looking at the the, one of the last uh, parts of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, something... um, that I, I think is very instructive for any congregation, but particularly uh, a congregation uh, during a time of discernment, during a time of, of longing and, and uh, expecting the power of the, the Lord to show up. So are, how many of you are expecting the Lord to show up? Good. Oh, good. That's nice. Sometimes I ask people questions like that, and they, uh, they, it's just... It's cricket, so um, you're already with me. Let's look together at Ephesians chapter 6 at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in His mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, speak, for we long to hear from You. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in Your sight, for You, O God, are our strength and our Redeemer, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So, um... Sometimes we like to reflect upon our childhood, and I had a particularly, um, for the most part, and we have bumps along the way, but for the most part it was happy, sort of happy, and um, I was about six or seven years old, and my dad built me this swing set, uh, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a good swing set, but, but once I turned nine, there was this sort of rite of passage, and the, the swing set was dismantled, and part of the swing set was rolled into the lot that was adjacent to my parents' house, and my dad built me a fort. And because my dad was an engineer who studied architecture in the 1960s, it was a split-level fort. So, you know, he kind of had to put his own little flourishes on it, and we, you know, didn't have you know, tons of lumber laying around, but we did have some leftover campaign signs for my, my uncle's campaign, and we, we took those signs and sort of enclosed the top of the fort, 
And so you'd kind of go up from one platform to another platform, and then I get to climb a little ladder and pop over, open a, a hatch door, and, and then I was in the, the command post. The command post was, was where I would go after school when the, when the bus would let all of us kids off and, and we would sort of get off the bus and, and convene at my house and we'd go over to the Ford and we, we'd get out these little plastic flower pots and we'd go all over the wooded lot collecting pine cones. And then, you know, we, we didn't need electronic gadgetry we just had pine cones and then we would commence our game of throwing them at each other pine cone war it was it was the best part of the day now my dad would often gather us together and say you know boys one day someone's going to get hurt so be very very careful not to throw the pine cones that have just fallen from the trees that are all still enclosed, that are all still green, because they really are sharp and they can be very, very dangerous. Well, so you know what somebody did, right? Looks like a grenade. Should be really fun, and you can make it that, that kind of pine cone go even further. And somebody got hit, and somebody got hurt. And my dad called us together again and said we had to stop it. So we hauled all of us to the tennis courts in the back of our neighborhood where we had to spend the rest of the afternoon looking for tennis balls that had flown over the fence. And we filled our little backpacks with the tennis balls. And the next day, our battle got safer, more predictable. We started lobbing squishy, soft, old tennis balls. We started playing it safe. Now the weapons that we once used were still all around us, provided for us like a manna from heaven. But we went to the manufactured weapons, the soft, squishy kind. We stopped using what God provided us. Now, the battle that the Apostle Paul writes about in the letter to the Ephesians isn't you know, quite uh, concerning the type of battle that my friends and I were engaged in when we were little kids, but it begs the question, how are you using the tools that God has given us? Are we using them to the best of our ability, or are we content with playing it safe? Our struggle, Paul says, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers of the world and the principalities of the spiritual realm who seek to confuse the messages that we receive every day. And many of us, I'm afraid, are content with replacing that with what which we have been naturally given, the pine cones, for instance, with something manufactured like old, squishy tennis balls just because somebody misused the weapons. So how are we using the power? How are we using the power that's been given to us from God? Are we settling for something safe? Or are we willing to put down that which is manufactured and pick up the full armor of God? Now, the fact of the matter is that all of us have come to church with a purpose. Our purpose is to give ourselves over to God, to worship Him, to love Him, to be in communion with each other and with Him. But our attempts at worship, our attempts at being church together are often crowded out by all of the confusing messages that fill our minds. Especially when we leave this place. We try to be still. We try to listen. We want to sing the songs of our faith. We want to take that to work with us on Monday morning, but all too often our hopes are subverted and we become confused. There's this alternate narrative playing in our head and we don't really know whether to take up the pine cone or replace it with a tennis ball. 
because confusion is rampant. It's the greatest tactic of the enemy. The early church father called John Christostom said this, the enemy doesn't make war on us straightforwardly. He always makes it deceitfully. But rather than getting to the source of our confusion, we often do anything within our power just to drown it out, to numb it, to throw old tennis balls at it. We do what is comfortable. We stay later at work. or We sleep a little bit longer. We do everything within our power to avoid any possible conflict. There's a former pastor of this church that at this point might actually have a bunch of tennis balls up here and he would then build a fort with them to show that we protect ourselves with anything that we can, even if it's not the full armor that we've been given from God. We just want to absorb the pain and we'll use whatever we can, even if it's a lesser option. We become self-absorbed. We become worried with with everything that's going on inside of our head. And this self-absorption, this absorbing the pain with something other than what God has given us is really the mortal enemy of the Spirit. Met a guy a few years ago named Stan. Stan was one of these guys that, you know, looked like he had it all together. So I was a little intimidated. And uh, Stan was born and raised in France. And he sort of, you know, had all the trappings of a, of a wealthy person that was born and raised in France. And he had, he had quit his job as an accountant to travel around the world. And uh, I thought, man, this guy's got it all together. He's got all the money he needs. He's a good-looking guy. He's traveling all over the world. He can go back to being an accountant whenever he wants. But after talking to Stan for about 15 minutes, I was able to discern that this, this desire to travel the world was really just disguising something deeper, something that he was, he was numbing his pain with travel. He wasn't really happy. He gave in to the alternate alternate soundtrack playing in his head. He said, Gana, don't be fooled by the French. When you Americans, you know, want to numb your pain, you just work longer. We French go on vacation. And the scriptures today give us the tools for our restless wondering. The fact of the matter is, we can go on vacation every single day by opening them up and by tapping into the power that we have that has been revealed to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. They give us tools for our restlessness, tools for our wandering thoughts, tools to arm us against the devil's schemes. The the solution, Paul says, to our wandering, to our restlessness, to our, our desire to numb the pain is very simple, but we often miss it. By turning to manufactured things. The solution is this. Prayer. Pray in the Spirit at all times. That is how we arm ourselves. And that means to pray as we go. To pray as we work. To pray as we play. Even pray when we're on vacation. <laughs> now to pray in the Spirit requires tapping in to a source that is greater than the source that seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. To pray in the Spirit means that in our moments of confusion, our moments of wondering, our moments of restlessness, we ask the Spirit to do for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. The Holy Spirit will focus us will direct us, will guide us into the way of all peace. The Spirit will cause us, as we sang earlier, to stand with hearts abandoned in awe of the One who gave Himself for all. You see, God acts in ways that we cannot. He enables us to do things that we cannot do. 
And this is what Paul is getting at when he tells the Ephesians to put on the full armor. Not just any kind of armor. The full armor. Have you ever put it on? I uh, was in a medieval castle one time, and I'm sort of a history nerd, and I, I really like things like castles and historic sites. And, and so uh, we got to go down into the catacombs underneath this medieval castle, and there was a little there was armor lining the wall. And there was this helmet on about an 8th century stone table. And the tour guide did something that tour guides never do. The tour guide said, here's a helmet. Who wants to put it on? I do. Okay, sir, right this way. Step up to the table. And he takes this helmet that was centuries old, worn by King Richard III or something of England and France, and he, he takes it to my, takes it and puts it around my head, but he, but he had to open it up. And it weighed like 40 some odd pounds, and he puts it right on top of me, and he closes it tight, and then he puts the mask, the face mask down, and I, you know, I'm not claustrophobic, but I was in that moment, and uh, I, I quickly sort of lifted the face mask, and, and Carrie took a picture, and, and then I was like, okay, helmet, off, now, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here, I can't remove it because it's so heavy, because the, the latches are so unfamiliar, and so the tour guide comes right behind me, unlatches it, lifts it from my head, and puts it back on the table. I needed help putting on my armor. I needed help getting dressed. Now, let me connect some dots here. If we're going to put on the full armor of God, we have to help each other get dressed. Yes, we do. An awkward conversation in church, but we must help each other get dressed. On my wedding day in this very church, I, I had my tie tied and my, my suit on, my shoes were polished. But what's the one thing no groom can do by himself? The boutonniere. The pin and the flower and the thing. Right, Carrie's aunt walks right through those doors and says, I got it, I got it. And comes at me with one of those straight pins and pins it on. It says, now you're ready. You're fully dressed. Now, if, if we pay attention to the life of the church, we notice that it happens all the time. We always help one another get dressed. We've, we've been to a Christmas play. We've been down to the Sunday school room when the, the little girl has lost her bow. We help her put it back on. But what about when we get older? Are we still willing to ask for help? Are we more receptive to the Spirit as we mature in the faith? And are we willing to collectively ask the power of God Almighty to clothe us with Himself? In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis recounts this story between an older, wiser, chief of staff kind of devil and a more lowly legislative aid kind of devil. And uh, they get in cahoots to figure out how to thwart the spiritual maturity of this young man who's recently come to faith. And so they in, embark upon this, this point-counterpoint letter-writing campaign where the Older devil advises the younger devil how to thwart this guy's spiritual growth. And the first thing they go for, the first thing they try to confuse, is this young man's ability to pray. So the young man, he goes to church and he, he starts having trouble. And he starts buying into what he hears at the wor- in, the, in the workplace, that prayer is not what professional smart people do. It's not rational. It's vague. It's irrelevant. And we often think that the devil is just tasked with putting bad stuff in our heads, but in reality, the devil is only tasked with confusion, with keeping the good stuff 
out of our brains. That's all that he can do. And so some of us have the gift of prayer. Some of us have the ability to tap into that even in the face of confusing messages. But many of the rest of us are going to admit, even if we're not going to articulate it this morning, that you know, I really do kind of need some help with that whole prayer thing. So, are you willing to help someone pray? <laughs> are you willing to ask for help? God wants to teach us to pray. God wants to give us good gifts. And in Luke's Gospel in chapter 11, Jesus says this. He's, he's teaching His disciples to pray. He, he articulates the words of what we call the Lord's Prayer. And then He goes on to say, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God wants to give us good gifts. He wants to teach us to pray. He wants to clothe us with Himself if we'll only ask. Praying in the Spirit doesn't mean that we're just praying to God and means that we're praying with God. We're engaged in a dialogue, an ongoing conversation with Him. Billy Graham says that asking for the Spirit places us at God's disposal. It's a continual, dynamic process. Praying the Spirit through this can become second nature to us. Rather than being in a conversation with all the confusing messages in our head, imagine what could happen if we broke through that to be engaged in a daily conversation with God. It was mentioned earlier that Carrie and I are engaged in campus ministry at the University of Mary Washington, really working to develop what we're calling a fresh expression of church for that campus. And, and one of the, th the things that we, we've determined in, in our sort of three-year journey with, with some of these students, many of whom uh, ask a question <laughs> three years ago, oh, what do you, what it, what is it, what's happening when you close your eyes and start talking? Really, we were asked this. And we have to say, well, prayer. They say, well, how, how do we learn how to do that? So we've, we've been engaging in this sort of practice of teaching them how to pray. And so we, we do really, really simple things. We start by saying, well, can you think of something that you're grateful for? What, what's something you're grateful for? And they just say, well, I'm grateful for the fact that I was able to get up out of bed this morning. And we say, okay, how about you start that? Start with that. Okay, so, so try this. Dear, dear Jesus, I'm thankful that I got up out of bed this morning. And then the whole group says, thank you, Jesus. And they go, huh. I said, yeah, that's, that's a prayer of gratitude. And then we go on with, with some other series of questions. How, what, is, what has maybe Jesus done for me this week? What is, um, how have I been an agent of the self-giving love of Jesus this week? And, and during this sort of process, every week, we, we instead of like going around the circle and taking prayer requests and somebody talking about their homework or their aunt's surgery, we, we just sort of say, well, is, is there one person that really has a burden? And we sort of single that person out. And we say, okay, everybody, those of you who have lots of experience of this and those who, of you who have no experience of this, just, just be quiet for a second and see if the Lord will give you a picture, a scripture, we even say, if he gives you a cartoon character, what comes to mind when you think about this person and the needs that they have in the group? And it is amazing what happens when you give God time to speak. And one by one, someone will say, well, I just, I have never read the book of Ruth, but you really remind me of Ruth because I just, I think that's right. And somebody else will say, oh my gosh, I got Ruth too, and I know the story. And it's because I really think you're on a, a journey and, and you're trying to figure out who you are. And then somebody else will get a scripture, and then somebody else will get a cartoon character, and, and it all confirms, and then the person that we're praying for will, will report back and say, oh my gosh, you will never believe what I need and it, how it, all of the things that you've said completely spoke to my need. I feel like my prayer's already been answered because we've given God time to speak, because we've taken on his armor, because we've picked up the things that he's given us. We're able to pray. We just say to our students, and I say it to you, that God wants us to attempt to imitate Him, to be agents of His love, to be agents of His mercy. And, and, and it's as easy as practicing His presence, practicing prayer with one another. 
And more and more and more as we practice this, we will grow into the armor that he has prepared for us. We don't always have to put it on from outside. It will grow up from within us. We, we know the story of King David when he was a little boy and when he was coming out of the fields and, and uh, he, he heard about this giant that needed to be put down. And he says, I'm the guy. I'm the guy to take out Goliath. And so, well, you know, King Saul sort of said, oh my goodness, well, I, I've got to give you this armor. I've got to put it on you. And, and he put it on and it, was, it, was, it didn't fit. It, he, wasn't, he wasn't ready for it. But there was something of a greater sense, a greater armor that had welled up inside of him because he knew that his relationship with God was strong enough. He knew what his call was and he knew what he was commanded to do. So he said, I don't need this manufactured stuff. I need to step into my true calling to take on the armor. And what did he do? He picked up some stones. And they probably laughed at him or thought he was completely crazy, but the stones got the job done because that was his calling. You as a church are going to have to ask some serious questions about what is your calling? What are you being called to? How are you, how are you being called to your equipping, your training in righteousness, stepping into armor and helping one another do that every single minute of every single day God loves you and God wants the best for you God wants to fill you with his spirit and he will if you ask we are subject to a daily battle are you going to step into faith are you going to stand firm It might be worthwhile this week to open up to that passage of Scripture. If you don't already have a prayer practice in the morning before you go to work or on the metro or wherever you are, and just sort of memorize these various elements. The belt of truth. Belt keeps your clothes together. The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness simply means just just putting on something that will make me yearn to be as holy as God is holy. What if I'm armed with holiness? And, and what, if, what if when we put on our shoes in the morning, we say, I'm, I'm being fitted with the shoes that bear the gospel of peace. And you pray, Lord, make me a peacemaker when I walk into the office on Monday morning because I know that there's going to be some conflict this week because we're in this budget process right now. And I need to be fitted with the gospel of peace. I need to take up the shield, not of protection, but the shield of faith. A shield that says, I am trusting that God is going to make a way where it seems that there is no way. And I'm going to remember that little quirky story about the helmet that closes around me because that's what's going to protect me from all of the arrows of the enemy, all of the confusing messages in my head because it is the helmet of my salvation. The helmet that says that I have been saved by grace through faith. And I'm going to take up a sword... But it's not going to be a sword like people at DOD think I should take up. It's going to be a sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit that is the word of the gospel of God. The sword that is good news. We can take all of these things up. We can get dressed in this way because of the power of the resurrected Jesus. He's shaken up the world and he's using us to be world shakers. World changers, elements of his life, elements of his resurrection, children of a promise that a new heavens and the new earth will come. Because Christ has defeated death. So step into this reality. Step into the possibility that that you with your armor, you being prayerful, can be at one with Christ in the Spirit at all times. Amen? Amen. We've come to a a time in the service where it it might be appropriate to call the church to prayer. It's a time in our tradition where we uh, respond.
And some of you may want to respond because you, you have a question about inviting the, that because you've been really suppressed and numbed and confused. But some of you may just have a longing uh, to, to have your heart fully abandoned to the Lord because you care so much about this mission outpost and your little mission outpost that you have in your life every day. And so as we sing um, this uh, familiar hymn, sweet hour, of, sweet hour of Prayer, may this be a sweet moment of prayer and decision for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Amen.